I know. You're probably wondering, what the heck? We were supposed to be looking at Nemesis today, and I was looking forward to seeing the lore runner just take Nemesis and beat it in the head over and over because it's such a terrible film. Point being, why am I talking about Galaxy Quest? A little bit of backstory, okay? First of all, for those of you who are not aware of this, I was actually going to look at the Star Trek movies a uh, little over two years ago now, give or take. I was all set to do it. I'd done a lot of prep work, and I was going to rewatch them and, you know, do analysis mode, the same exact thing I've been doing, you know, these last few weeks. And then, as I've said many times, and I know I know I'm repeating myself here, but, you know, for, for various reasons that involve derogatory comments and comparisons to someone else who had done something similar, I decided against it. But one of the things I decided, even back then, was I was going to include another movie in the mix, one that would probably get some weird eyebrow raises, but I felt genuinely deserved to be considered along the Star Trek movies, Galaxy Quest. It was, admittedly, there's part of part of it was to help distinguish uh, my own look at the movies from sci-fi debris, but honestly, there is a more genuine reason for that, and that's the reason I've decided to continue doing it now, because since then, sci-fi debris has looked at Galaxy Quest, so whatever. But I digress. The point is, I do still feel, and, and I've felt for many years, that this belongs here because this is a Star Trek film. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. I have long since been a proponent of the idea that a label does not really mean anything. It can, but a label by itself does not mean anything. Just because you call something Final Fantasy Adventure does not make it a Final Fantasy game. And just because you call something something else does not make it the primary thing. Let me give you uh, three big examples. I already gave you one. Final Fantasy Adventure, Final Fantasy Legends. Those are both great examples. Those are not Final Fantasy games. I'm not saying those are bad games, but very few people could deny that they are, you know, not Final Fantasy games, right? Second example. Who decides what can be considered Star Wars and actually is a part of Star Wars? Is it Disney? Or is it us? With regards to, you know, the extended continuity. Third example. Um... Let's say we're going to come out with a game and we're going to call it, I don't know, Mass Effect 3. Who gets to decide if it's Mass Effect 3? Who de gets to decide if it's a Mass Effect game? Now, if you're getting the common thread here, the point is it's all about the individual. You, me, they, us, we. The individual gets to decide what actually qualifies, what that actually means for us. Now, some people don't put a lot of thought into it. I have actually known someone personally who says the company who owns the IP decides, and that's that. I know a lot of people who think the majority opinion decides, and that's that, you know, etc. For me personally, I think it's the individual decides. If I look at a work, and I put a lot of thought into this, if I look at a work and I feel like it has these core tenets that define it as a blank, a Final Fantasy, a Mass Effect, a Dragon Age, a, you know, a Baldur's Gate, whatever. If, if, it, if this core tenant that makes it that kind of a thing, that aspect of the thing, if I see something else that shares those aspects in such a way that it fits, not just barely fits or kind of fits, but I mean really fits in, then I feel like that deserves to be qualified that. And I stress the way I say that, it deserves that. It is an honor to be considered that. For example, as I've said many times, I consider Chrono Trigger to be one of the best Final Fantasy games of all time. Good example of that, right? So I have felt, basically ever since this movie came out, and I saw this in theaters, that Galaxy Quest is a Star Trek film. Let's talk about what core tenets I feel it really has to define it as such. First and foremost, a lighthearted show about Star Trek in space. There's actually a lot of serious elements to this sh this movie. Really, there are. But overall, it does have that same feeling of idealism and optimism, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Second thing, uh, character focus. There's actually a surprising amount of character uh, characterization, you know, before the movie begins, and character growth throughout the course of the movie for basically all of our major characters and a few of the side characters as well. Really good job on that. It's also, of course, you know, science fiction, which, <laughs> shrug. Uh, it also has the same overall approach and flavor to it. It is worth noting that Galaxy Quest was not designed to be about Star Trek specifically. I'm not going to go into the whole backstory of how this movie... In fact, this rumination is probably going to be a little short, to be honest with you, because I don't actually have that much to dissect when it comes to things like plot and setting, because they're effectively irrelevant um, <laughs> when it comes to looking at this movie. But the point is, it has a lot of the hallmarks of Star Trek, especially that idealism thing I just talked about. I'm a weird person when it comes to this, because I've always felt that some of the best Star Trek comes from when Star Trek is at its darkest. Wrath of Khan, Undiscovered Country, Tapestry, um, the episode I can never remember from original series, even though I, I keep referencing this damn episode. Um, the one with the the, the Executioner, uh, Chronos, uh, shoot, 
Kodos, the executioner, that episode. Um, uh, Tapestry, like I just said, uh, in, in the Pale Moonlight. These are very dark episodes and have a lot of dark elements and themes to them. And yet, the one thing that really tends to stay common, the common thread throughout all of these works, is the idea of optimism and idealism. I bash Roddenberry here and there, and will probably continue to do so, to be completely honest with you, uh, mostly when we get to the, t the early TNG stuff. But one thing I will always give the man, one of many things, because I've given the man many things, is the fact that his overall vision, for lack of a better term, was something I could really get behind. I have been asked many times, and I, I, have, I have made a whole game, a whole intellectual thought-based game on the idea of the tier system, you know, being transported into a fictional setting, to, to summarize. Many of my viewers have talked about this. I get this question still to this day every now and again, you know, if you had a tier three, or would you pick this place at a tier two, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Star Trek is almost, almost always at the top of my list for all the tiers, though. And I think the basic reason why is even at tier zero, in other words, if I, this human being, no changes whatsoever, no co convenience features, no nothing, were dropped into Star Trek, that that would still be a life worth living. In fact, I think it would be a better life than the life I'm living right now, if I'm being blunt. That says something about the, the world, for lack of a better term, that Roddenberry helped create, that he envisioned. And that's all about that idealism, that optimism. Yes, they go through dark times. Yes, they have to work for it. Yes, they have to strive and struggle. Yes, there are losses. And yet at the end of that, there's always something wondrous and amazing waiting for you. There's something worth fighting for. There's something worth continuing on to, to, to reach or to get to, to end the fight. And that's what I feel this movie really embodies. That idealism, that optimism. This is a pretty dark movie. There's a fair amount of death in this movie. Um, I'm actually going to pause for a moment. If you have not watched this movie, take this as a sincere recommendation. Uh, if you like comedy films, science fiction, or Star Trek, or any combination of these three things, go get a copy, copy of Galaxy Quest and just watch it through at least once. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. But I am honestly recommending it. Uh, to date, I have not recommended it to any, anyone who didn't actually like it. So... And now that I've said that, of course, I have invited many people to say, oh, I hate this film. And that's fine. It really is. As long as you're not deriding me for my opinion, I have no problem with yours. But that optimism and idealism is really what this movie is all about. And again, is what Star Trek has always been about. What is this movie if not a celebration? An enthusiastic, honest, honest enthusiasm oozes through every pore of this movie. It's been called a parody before, but I'm not sure that's actually accurate. It certainly has a warts and all approach to looking at things like Star Trek. But if you'll forgive me for the quote, warts and all also includes the all. That there is a reason why we like that. The real elements of things that, that have such significance, you know? If I can... Well... I'm going to go ahead and pause here because the biggest point I want to make about that I'll be making last, okay? So let's go ahead and, and look at the uh, let's look at the characters because that's most of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, in order, we have Tommy Weber, that's the the young black gentleman who uh, was the pilot back on the show. He's an interesting character arc because it took me a while to determine if he had a character arc. For the most part, he feels like an extra in the movie, and yet he has a lot of scenes and a lot of screen time and a lot of things dedicated to him. So you don't, I mean, there's got to be something that moved with him, right? The more I thought about it, the more I realized what it was. Now, all of the major characters have fairly s a lot of similarities in their overall character arc. It's just being expressed in different ways. You know, you could say all of them are trying to relive the glory days. You can say all of them are trying to make do with what they have, you know, that kind of thing. But there's nuances that separate them from, from each other. For instance, with Tommy, the kid... He is someone who has never had better than what he had then. He has always been living in that basic fantasy, the fictional reality of, of that. And, you know, yeah, he's got his day-to-day -day life, and yeah, he's, he's paying the bills with his fictional reality, and he's probably rather disgruntled about the situation. But every time he gets up there, and every time he's signing those things, and every time he's on stage, it's back into that fantasy. But the point of a fantasy is that one way or another, a fantasy is all about escape. Here... Tommy gets to see it for real. He's one of the people who freaks out the most. I'd say second only to Guy, which we'll get to in a moment. And he's the guy who has no idea how to deal with the pressure of 
actual responsibility being on his shoulders for the first time probably in his entire life. I mean, other than responsibilities like paying your bills and getting a job. I mean, that's mundane compared to the responsibilities he suddenly has to shoulder. And yet when he finally comes to the hard realization, when he finally comes to grips with the fact that this is real, he doesn't shrink from it. He embraces it. He says, yes, I'm going to make this happen. Yes, I'm going to. He puts his effort into it and his hole into it because now the fantasy is gone and now he has something better, the real thing. Now he's actually the pilot. Now he's actually helping people. Now he's actually doing something worth a damn. And it means something to him. And you could see it. Probably the best scene to describe this, I think, in the whole movie is when uh, the captain, Jason, Captain Nesmith, you know, target, <laughs> uh, asks, you know, can you think you get close to those minds? And he thinks, are you insane? And then he realizes, ah, oh, I think I can. And there's just so much enthusiasm there, right? Look at the next character. Um, Fred Kwan, played by the always awesome Tony Shalhoub. He played Monk on Monk, if you're not familiar with the name. He's another interesting... Uh, slight shade variance on the main core theme of, you know, has-been, because his theme is literally that he is a has-been. He's someone who acts like he's basically stoned the entire time. We don't know if he's actually on drugs, although that is implied several times, or if he's someone who is just coping with the only way he can. But a couple interesting things about him, despite being stoned the entire movie, with a couple exceptions, he's the only one who really shows no rancor towards his fellow cast members. He's the one who really seems to care about these people and really think of them as his friends despite everything, whereas most of them kind of despise each other, at least at the beginning. And he also has an interesting th facet to him that nothing seems to phase him. The reason why is what I already said. He's a has-been. He's already done what he could do. He's already accomplished the best that he could accomplish. And now, what's it matter? This is why I say it doesn't necessarily mean drugs. It could literally just be his coping mechanism. What's the point? The ship's exploding. Okay. I've already been there, and I've already done that. I've already done my best to accomplish what I could accomplish in this world. And now, all I am is a waste of space. And that's his attitude and perspective throughout the course of the movie, right up until the moment when he realizes that he can still do something. I know, I know. It's a very common character theme, but it's very well presented. Tony Shalhoub is a great actor with his face. Watch his expressions. He does some amazing stuff. And there's a scene where he comes to realize that he can still do something. He can still make a difference. And he decides to go ahead and do so, and succeeds brilliantly. And then gets to have sex with a tentacle monster. He's okay with it, so, you know, I'm not here to judge. <laughs> Uh, let's look at Gwen DeMarco, a.k.a. Sigourney Weaver. Now, this is a funny one because I feel like there's some a, a bit of a meta example to this. Um, Sigourney Weaver herself described her character as a dumb blonde, but I don't believe that for a second. It's very obvious that Gwen, the character, and her character on the show, whose name I don't know because I don't feel like memorizing three layers of names... <laughs> for this video. I'm bad enough with names. I actually have a note of names right here just to help me stay clear on that. Um, anyways, it's very clear that she was hired on the show to be eye candy. Yeah, that sucks. It's stupid. It's dumb. Especially with someone who obviously has at least a modicum of talent and, in my opinion, a brain. The funny thing about her character arc is her character arc could be best described by the word competence. And I think that this is where the meta thing comes in, in my opinion, because she's played by Sigourney freaking Weaver, someone who is usually synonymous with one of the best female protagonists in history. <laughs> Fun little anecdote. Uh, so oftentimes, fans like myself will debate, you know, who's the best um, protagonist or antagonist or whatever of blank variety. And one of those is they tend to divide it into genders, male protagonists, female protagonists, and, you know, or male protagonists in sci-fi, female protagonists in sci-fi, that kind of thing, right? One of the characters that is almost always at the top of the list of best female protagonist is usually Ellen Ripley. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> Sigourney Weaver really nailed it back in Alien, and uh, there's a reason her career has had so many excellent elements since then. And some not-so-excellent ones as well, but, you know, whatever. No offense to the woman, though. None at all. I don't want her to punch me. <laughs> Point being competence. The portrayal of Gwen is someone who probably 
is not, I don't think anyone in the universe, in the setting, actually looks down on Gwen. But I feel like she thinks they do. Because she looks down on herself. Her job was to look pretty and repeat whatever everyone said to the ship and what the ship said back to them. In her own words, there's one dumb, dumb job on this ship, but it's mine and I'm going to do it. It's a, it's, a, it's a problem I have in real life, and I can't think of the term of it all of a sudden because I'm an idiot. Um, lack, of, uh, lack of confidence, basically. You know, looking down upon yourself. And when she goes throughout this movie, if you notice, her demeanor kind of changes subtly and quietly throughout the course of it. Hers is probably one of the quietest character uh, arcs, because by the be at the beginning she's just, uh, and then she gets she's basically <laughs> smacked in the face with the reality of you know her job was meaningless, but she keeps rising to the occasion. At no point in time does she actually stop getting better at what she's doing. She demonstrates competence through her actions, and so by the end she can freely accept that others respect her. Because she now respects herself. Because she has come to the realization for herself that she is not just some dumb blonde. That she is someone who can actually accomplish things. Then we have uh, Guy Fliegman, played by the awesome Sam Rockwell. This is great, because his character arc is my favorite, and he's probably my favorite character in this movie. Uh, honestly, I thought about saving him for last of this character discussion, but I mean... So, what I like most about him is his characterization at the beginning. He doesn't have much of a character arc. It's like a hop, as opposed to everyone else who does a pretty big arc. His is just like this, but he starts out at a very interesting place. He's someone who played, like, Random Actor 6, right? Random Security Guard 6. And yet he was a fan of the show. Now, that's an important distinction. Most everyone else basically viewed the show as a job. In some cases, they resented it. In some cases, they clung to it because it was all they had, like in the case with Fred and Jason. But Guy liked the show. He kept going to those conventions. He kept sticking around for all the events and the parties. Why? Because it meant something to him. Because he had genuine enthusiasm for the show. And it's funny because that puts him in a very unique position, character-wise, from the perspective of the writer of the movie. See, one of the things that that makes of him is it makes him to be in a situation where he's the one who can point out, you know, obvious things. He's, he's very genre-savvy is basically the best way to put it. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't open the door to an alien planet. Maybe those cute aliens are secretly evil. Maybe we should, you know. He has several examples of this. And, of course, he gets into a position where he is genuinely terrified because he realizes he's the red shirt. Oh my god, he's the guy who's going to go out to die to prove the situation serious. Because that was his role on the show. But getting back to the characterization point, I like him because at no point does it feel like he's clinging to his role. I, he's the guy who's like announcing things and he's talking to the convention and he's like, yeah, we're going with this thing, you know. But I don't feel like he's milking it. And that's a key distinction. I don't feel like Guy was ever milking his role. I think he was also a fan. That he had the same enthusiasm that those people out in the crowd did. And he wanted to share it with them just like they wanted to share it around. You know, it, it was it shared enthusiasm is one of the things I think is one of the greatest inventions in human society. And he was just gushing with it. And like with uh, like with Tommy, I keep <laughs> I keep glancing at my notes for the names here. Like with Tommy, he uh, he showed that when the situation became real, he manned up to it. He looked at a real situation of real consequences and real horrifying things that most people can't deal with and said, you know what, and in his own words, I'm not going to die a coward. He was willing to go out there on a suicide run just to distract them enough to save lives. Because he didn't want to die a coward, because he wanted to do it for real. And he, did, he ended up not having to, which is great. I would, I, I'm actually really happy that he didn't have to die. Um... Not just because I like Sam Rockwell, for that matter. But either way, excellent little... Uh, and that's that's his character arc development. Again, uh, minor arc. Then we have Alexander Dane, played by one of my favorite actors of all time, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman, who was the reason I went to see Harry Potter in the movies, by the way. <laughs> Alan Rickman has a fascinating character arc. His characterization is obvious. He is very clearly based off of the, you know high-minded, serious actor who puts a lot of his himself and his effort into his craft and finds it demeaning to be uh, you know, brought down to the level of the, act, of the role that everyone remembers him for. 
A lot of people have compared him to Leonard Nimoy, but if I'm being honest with myself, um, I think another actor actually works better for him there. And I suddenly can't think of his name. I'm literally sitting... He played Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original trilogy. Oh my god. Alec Guinness. There we go. God. Ugh. Alec Guinness. I'm really tired. Alec Guinness is probably, I think, the poster child for how Alan Rickman played Alexander Dane. I'm just tossing names out today. This is, <laughs> this is going to be a weird rumination if you have no idea who these people are. But he plays him. It's that exact same thing. He's a very serious actor. He puts all of his art, all of himself forward. Even for the show he thought was crap, he still put his best forward. And it's what he's remembered most for. And he resents that. Again, the Alec Guinness comparison seems kind of blatant if you think about it. But I mention this because that's all his characterization. A lot of resentment, a lot of bitterness. It really is best described, all of his character arc is best described by a single scene. They just saved all the people in the bay. Get the thing open. Everyone's celebrating, and they're all saying, he has saved us, he has saved us. And Alan Rick, or, excuse me, Alexander Dane is walking around. He's basking in the praise, finally, finally getting recognition. And then they say, Captain Tackett has saved us. And he's like, oh, really? But that scene keeps going. That's not the end of that scene. One of the aliens is named Quellick. I like Quellick. Uh, this is your last chance for spoiler alerts because Quellick died. Quellick dies during the course of this movie. He gets shot. This is the scene continuing going. Same scene. And Alexander Dane goes over and he realizes he's, gonna, he's going to die. And throughout the whole movie, and I mean the whole movie, he has been resentful of saying his catchphrase to the point where he actually refused to say it on a few occasions and prevented other people from saying it. He was so resentful of it because it reminded him of all that was wrong with it. He put forth his heart and his mind and his effort and he did his best and what he got was a freaking catchphrase. And yet in this moment, he gets what he has always wanted. It's not actually recognition, not per se. It is impact. As Quellick is laying there, dying, he reveals to him, you know, the full extent of how much Alexander Dane meant to him. You have always been a father figure to me. You have always been an inspiration to me. I'm sorry I failed you, sir. And in that moment, Alexander Dane realizes that he has had what he's always wanted in this one man. He has had a genuine, strong, powerful impact. His acting reached someone. And it rebounds. It's, it's like a, it, it, a cascading sound wave. It goes right back onto him tenfold as, he as, as Quellick's death has that much more impact on him. And he finally says the catchphrase, not with resentment, not with groaning, oh, fine, I'll say it. He says it with total sincerity. And then he goes out and physically strangles one of the alien enemies to death. <laughs> That's my favorite scene, uh, pretty much in the whole movie, actually. It's a great scene. Um, but yeah, that's his character arc. And then we come to Jason Nesmith, uh, played by Tim Allen. Some people don't even know who Tim Allen is in the modern era, so I'm going to let you in on a little thing. He was pretty popular right about when this movie came out. He had uh, a real good knack for playing a combination arrogance without going into pompacity, and confidence without going into, you know, snobbishness, and at the same time managing to balance that with sort of an everyman feel. It was a really weird mix, and so he got a lot of roles as a result of that. And he was almost Im immediately picked for this movie, even when they were in the early stages, uh, before it was actually called Galaxy Quest. Uh, but like I said, I don't want to get too much into the behind the scenes of this movie. Suffice it to say that Nesmith's arc is, in my opinion, the most complicated of the various arcs of the character, because his characterization is very simple, actually. He is actually a has-been, like, uh, like Fred uh, is afraid that he is. He is unlike, you know, so Fred fears that he's a has-been when he can still do great things. Guy is, has great enthusiasm and isn't just trying to milk it. Jason is the opposite of both these things. Jason is a husband who is just trying to milk it. His one glory, moment of glory, his one spot in the sunlight, it's gone, he knows it, and it eats at him constantly. Because he knows he's a husband. He knows he's a hack. He knows it's over. And it's been over for years. And so he clings to it, clings to it with desperation. Watch the beginning of this movie sometime. Seriously, go watch it again. It's a great movie. I, I'm actually thinking about watching it again again, just for fun, because I really like this movie. Um... 
he, at the beginning of the movie, he's like, yeah, everything's great. And he's just soaking it up and, yeah, playing to the crowd. And all of that evaporates. He goes into the bathroom and he hears a few kids talk about how pathetic it is that, you know, all this stuff is happening and how pathetic he is for continuing to portray himself in this manner. I'm not going to point out the obvious logical flaw of paying to go to a convention, which is not cheap, in order to just be, just because you think it's terrible and stupid. I'm not even going to go into that. Let's, let's not talk about that. Suffice it to say... Some people have argued that his rather sudden shift from, yeah, to actual anger and yelling at a fan and telling them to get a life is out of character. But it isn't, at least in my perspective. It's perfectly in character because that's what he's telling himself every day. Get a life, Jason. You're nothing. You had one good run and that's it. Thus, his character arc is him crawling out of that. When he starts to realize the reality of the situation, what's the first thing he does? What is the very first thing he does? He goes to his old crew. This, I think, is probably the most significant moment in the entire movie. I've actually heard debates about this exact scene. I've had debates about this exact scene. Why does he go back to the crew? It is my opinion that it is the very human need in him to share it with people who are the closest things to friends he's ever had. They may resent him. He may not really be on good terms with them. But in the end, those are his friends. Those are people he cares about. And he saw something amazing, something real. And he doesn't want to hog it. Unlike when he's up there on that stage with the spotlight, he wants to share this. And so he goes out of his way to reach them, to share this to them, to try and convince them of this. Throughout the course of the movie, we get to the point he he the next bit of his character arc is him pretending to be the captain. He's still an actor, in other words. He's still acting like the captain, other than actually being the captain. And so if you pay attention, most of his initial commands and most of his initial plans fail miserably. And they only get away from things because of sheer luck and a bit of uh, technological uh, situation, which I don't feel like getting into. Um... So somehow, you know, things end up working out. And it's that's great. That's awesome. But then things start to get really serious. And he's left behind on the planet. And for the first time, someone's one of their lives is actually threatened. Now, I stress this because lives have been threatened up until this point. But this is the first time his life, one of their lives, I really should trust that, is threatened. Because they know each other. I don't, I'm not trying to call them evil or callous. But it is an entirely different feeling to see a stranger in danger to someone you've known for 20 years in danger. Your, your reaction emotionally is going to be different there. He gets in danger. He tries. To, he barely survives this thing. He ends up trying to deal with the rock monster. The I, I forget what they call it. Grog? Uh, Grog? Yeah, it doesn't matter. And when he gets out of that, he yeah, gets his shirt off, of course, there is such honest joy on his face as he shares it with them because that's the first time they actually succeeded at something. And they succeeded at it specifically because they stopped trying to play the role and started actually being the role. It was the very first step, and it was absolutely necessary to allow for the next step. Because what's the next thing he does? He tells the, the general, whose name I don't know how to pronounce, Robin Sox, uh, the truth. He tells him the truth. He freely admits, I will do whatever I have to, to to save his life. I will tell him this horrible thing that will break his spirit if it will save his life. I will accept this death, you know, and my suffering to do this. He is exactly as self-sacrificing and noble as his character, his the show's character, was supposed to be. If he hadn't made that previous step with the realization of the reality of the situation and the acknowledgement of, you know, the real stakes and actually doing rather than pretending, I don't think he would have been able to make that next logical leap into actually being a captain. Because that is a captain's choice that he makes there. And then, of course, he has the wonderful scene where he and uh, Alexander Dane, you know, ah, pff, ah, pff. good scene. Um, and then he starts giving actual orders. He starts actually, and, and again, that's kind of the, the culmination of his arc, except for one final t tidbit. See, he makes a comment early on in the movie that really helps foreshadow this. Early on, he's, he's a glory hog, right? Like I said, desperate, clinging to it. And yet he makes the comment, I wouldn't be a commander without my crew. The last thing we see of him before they cut to the, and then the adventures continue, and the next generation, um, is he's up there on stage and everyone's applauding him, and he turns around and he says, no, no, no. 
and he insists the rest of his crew come up and bow with him. And again, it boils back to that human element of what he did back when he got back, when he first got back to Earth. He wanted to share it. I am not a commander without my crew. I think that was always a catchphrase before. You see how this ties in? It was always a catchphrase. It was always just something he was saying because he was acting. Now he has done it for real. He's no longer pretending to be the captain. He is the captain. And now that he is the captain, he understands it wasn't just a line. It meant something. And now he's willing to live it. And so he's willing to share it with them. I like that scene too, by the way. A couple other uh, comments there, because that's basically all the cat, uh, characters, really, when you come down to it. I like the fact that the fans end up saving the day. You may call that, you know, hackneyed or whatever you want to call it, but I think it's very appropriate because um, fans have saved the day with Star Trek more than once. <laughs> it's actually been argued uh, at least three times fans have saved Star Trek. Once by uh, allowing Star Trek to have a third season, once by bringing Star Trek back uh, for the uh, for the motion picture era and, and the movie verse, and one final time for allowing Star Trek to endure Star Trek V, basically. Unfortunately, fan uh, fans were not able to save us from Nemesis, but I digress. <sighs> I'm going to go ahead and talk about a topic now, which isn't necessarily related to Galaxy Quest, except that it is, because it integrally ties into Star Trek, Galaxy Quest, and a lot of other facts and fiction. I mentioned that Get a Lifeline. One of the things I've talked about a lot of in my stream is the idea that something that is fake does not automatically not matter. I know that's a badly constructed sense. Let me try that again. So just because something is fake doesn't mean it doesn't matter. There we go. It's a little better. I may be playing a fake game with fake characters or watching a fake movie with fake characters or, you know, spend real money on fake things in order to get fake things, right? In, in a game, you know, spending money on a, on a new mount in World of Warcraft. That is a bit, bunch of digital bit. Why would anyone spend real money on that? How many of you out there were upset when Shepard died in Mass Effect 2? That was a fake character. But the fakeness of the character does not change the fact that it had real impact on us. The emotions we felt, the thought discussions we had, the interactions we have had with each other, the fact that I'm talking to you right now, all of this is real. All of this real interaction and real feeling and real thought all came because of something that was fake. Do you understand? Star Trek is just a show in movies and books. and It's just a franchise, right? And I would never argue that, you know, if, you, if I was given the choice, kill these people or kill all of Star Trek forever, I mean, that's a dumb choice. I choose the people. But that does not, by the same token, mean that Star Trek doesn't matter. It does not mean Mass Effect does not matter. It does not mean Star Wars does not matter. And insert anything here. It really doesn't, you know, it applies equally. Galaxy Quest is all about that real feeling and the real connection between real people that a fake thing had upon them. And nowhere is this more emphasized than by the Thermians. Uh, the General, Robin Sox, actually has this great line where he says, You have hurt them more than I ever could by giving them this fake, false hope. And it was fake. And it was false. But it had a real impact on them. Listen to them talk about how much their society changed after interacting with them. All of the ch changes in their society, all of what happened to them, them overturning you know, the, the, the problems they had societally, economically, structurally, before they, they were inspired by something that was fake, had a real impact. I know, I'm talking about something real in fiction, just bear with me. The point being, it had a real impact on their society, on their people, on their structure. You know, their, their societal structure, their cultural structure. The, the general was wrong, in other words. They didn't do any harm to them. All they did was provided something that real people could have real interactions with. Just like the movie does with us. Just like Star Trek does with us. I will never forget the first time I ever went to a Star Trek convention. It was in Anaheim, California. <laughs> That's where I met uh, Leonard Nimoy, actually and William Shatner. This was before Deep Space Nine was even out. And 
there were so many people there. Some of them were in costume, you know, some of them were, most were not. This was a while ago. So, you know, the, the idea of costume going in cons has, hadn't really reached the height that it has nowadays. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just giving you perspective because this was a while ago. I imagine this is actually before some of my viewers were even born. But I go there and I see people everywhere. And I'll never forget. I, I actually, I was with my dad and we, we go along and there's this, this couple who was having a discussion about whether or not a Romulan warbird's cloak should be considered superior to the Klingon's cloak of the time. A little bit of technical minutia. And they weren't arguing out of like they weren't arguing about it at all. Actually, they weren't doing. Well, I passed the thing. There was no, you know, stereotype here. It was just two people discussing it because they found it interesting, and I just kind of slid into the conversation naturally and was like, "Well, what about this? What about this?" And they pointed out, "Well, what about this episode?" And I hadn't thought about that episode. And that was a good point. And we ended up just discussing it for like five minutes. Two totally random strangers. I don't know their names. I never did learn them. I remember their faces, but that's it. <laughs> That was my first interaction with other Star Trek fans that weren't family or friends, you know. And it stuck with me because the whole convention was that way. It was just a whole bunch of people sharing an enthusiasm. A whole bunch of people saying, we love Star Trek. Let's discuss. And I like that. And that is Galaxy Quest in a nutshell. And that's why it ties into that whole theme of what Star Trek is. That idealism, that optimism. That something good could come out of something fake. I, I, I just feel like... I, I, that feels like a good note to end on, but I want to stress, stress one other thing. One of the things they went on to when they made this movie, they really wanted to make the scenes that were real uh, feel more real. They put a lot of effort into the effects, a ton of effort into the, into the costumes and the, the makeup and the set designs. But my favorite way to describe the attitude that went into Galaxy Quest, which ties into this overall theme I'm talking about, those of you who know, know that on Star Trek, uh, there's actually methods that are taught to the actors to pretend they've been hit on a ship. And they've got code words and everything. You know, <laughs> you know, I can't do them, obviously. But if you've ever seen them do it when they're just on the deck, you know, on the, the static bridge, it looks kind of silly. And it also kind of explains a few things. And, of course, they have special methods that they determined. Where they actually have, like, a, a rod here, which they'd smack, and that would make the camera go like that, that kind of a thing. They didn't want that for this movie. They wanted to go full tilt and make it feel as real as possible. So the whole bridge was actually built on a giant device which could actually shake and move and rotate. So when you see them being tossed around to the bridge, that's actually the actors being tossed around because the actual bridge is doing this. I just wanted to share that really badly. So that's all I got, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Next week, we'll go back to bashing Nemesis. I promise. Have a good one, guys.